So this next particular section is entitled Well-Being of the EMT. And what, what's this all about? Uh, basically, what it's all about is just making sure that as an EMS provider, an EMT, you make sure that you take care of yourself and you try not to stress out too much about situations that you can't necessarily control and then also understand that yes the job is difficult but it is very important to take care of yourself and uh, throughout this entire section you'll see uh, some some pretty interesting pictures you know such as this one right here um, where they're putting him in the back of the ambulance so the the general idea here is is don't become this don't become this kind of a provider So there's emotional aspects of providing uh, emergency care. Um, we're going to start with death and dying process. This is the the grieving, uh, this, the typical standard steps that occur whenever an individual experiences a loss of any sorts. It's not necessarily just for death and dying, but this could be any kind of a loss. You know, it could be a loss of a limb. It could be loss of uh, a spouse or it could be a loss of you know a certain life situation or even an object generally speaking we'll go through all of these phases before we finally decide to move on and here's all the five phases and and typically these do these do occur in this order again this is an average but it isn't necessarily a typical experience of everybody all the time. So you may find that whenever you're dealing with a grief situation you where you have to go through these uh, grieving process, you might not necessarily be going through denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance in that particular order. You, you may kind of skip around from one to the other. You may have many phases of you know recovery and then all of a sudden you know you're back to square one where you're in denial again so what what exactly is denial well denial is basically we refuse to accept that this situation has actually occurred so a lot of times just to use an illustration you may see a patient or a patient's family members who are just kind of emotionally detached from the situation altogether and they might not be able to believe that it's actually happening that you know one of their loved ones is injured or that they're actually injured and you know, sometimes you know you you liken this to where say somebody has an amputation and they're trying to pick up the amputation amputated part and put it back on it just it, things don't work that way but the denial is that you know we can just put it back and everything's going to be fine unfortunately that's not a realistic thing that can actually occur so denial is is kind of like a protective mechanism because it it protects the person from emotionally having to deal with that situation at that particular point in time the next phase uh, is typically anger uh, that you know they, they might be saying things like why me uh, they might also be angry at other people, so this isn't necessarily something that just occurs, you know, uh, as as though that they might feel like, gosh, you know, why would this happen to me in my life? But they may start blaming other people, and they may start blaming uh, you, even as the provider, if you're giving them assistance. Is you know, why why are they here? What's going on? This is you know this isn't my fault you know defensive mechanism as well so you know you might see a lot of a lot of anger for somebody who is in the grieving process and again um, for you as the provider you know you you're gonna go through these phases repeatedly over and over again because of the kinds of calls that you're gonna be exposed to if you already haven't bargaining uh, you know okay but first let me do such and such so bargaining is just trying to get your way out of the situation altogether now some sometimes people will think that um, you know this is actually 
it's it's actually denial but it's a little bit different than denial it's it's trying to get the situation understanding that there is a problem but trying to get the situation back to not necessarily be a problem anymore so and then we have depression okay but I haven't I don't know if that's necessarily an acceptable uh, example of what depression is but depression can be you know many things they can be just generally down in the situation um, and then you have acceptance where you know okay I finally accepted the situation and I'm not afraid to uh, you know move on and one of the things that is so important about this particular topic is that you know when people go through the death and dying phases or they go through any kind of grieving process say they have a traumatic life event that they have to deal with the people that typically tend to do the best are the people who go through the process in a normal fashion but then move on with their life as horrible as that may sound they move on they do the things that they need to do the simple tasks that need to be done in order to move forward with their lives and so these stages of uh, grief are very important for you to know because you will be encountering them on a day-to-day -day basis but not just for that reason also for yourself remember that you may end up going through these types of situations over and over again because you are dealing with very traumatic events and there are certain times where you may actually end up going through these phases so how do you deal with the dying patient and their family members well you know this is this is always a difficult one because you know there's just things happening in people's lives that are so dramatic when you get in there to help them out and you need to know what to expect and and what you should be doing uh, for them and these are these are times that they're going to remember uh, the patient needs to include um, or excuse me we, we need to be uh, respectful of the patient uh, we need to make sure that uh, we treat them with dignity we communicate well with them uh, what's going on you know family members again might be very angry at us they might be angry at other family members you may see uh, you know very emotional reactions occurring at the same time you, you want to be there to listen and you know they always say don't falsely reassure them so how do we avoid falsely reassuring people you know you don't tell them that the patient is gonna make it you don't tell them that you know when you know they're not going to make it you don't tell them you don't make guarantees or promises that you know something's gonna happen you you can't do any of that um, mainly because of liability reasons but the other reasons why you wouldn't necessarily want to do that is because you would not want for them to expect that the problem is going to be solved and then it doesn't and then they have an emotional reaction well you know he said that it was going to be fixed and then they're angry at you so and, and, and again it's not just it's not just an issue of liability but it's an issue of uh, you know preventing further harm from from them having the emotional reaction when things didn't go the way that they had expected them to go uh, also along with that um, you know the the question is well if I can't falsely reassure them what should I tell them well you just basically tell them that you know you're doing everything that you can so say you get a question is he is he gonna be okay well I don't know would be the answer you say well, I don't know but we are definitely doing everything that we possibly can do to make sure that he's gonna be alright or we're gonna do everything that we possibly can to help him and help or help her and make the situation better you know it, you can't necessarily guarantee anything but you can show them that you're you're trying and you're doing everything possible and I think that that people expect that out of you as a provider and I think that as long as you uh, don't falsely assure or far, falsely promise you won't get yourself into a bad situation 
again, you want to be on their side, and this is a good way to make sure that you are. Uh, use a gentle tone of voice, so don't, you know, when, whenever you're talking to them, make sure that you're not angry or uh, shouting at them or condescending. Just, you know, be very, very nice about uh, the situation. Granted, it is an emergent situation, but uh, use that gentle tone of voice. Let the patient know that you are doing everything. Again, just like we said. Also, um, when it says use a re reassuring touch, you know, this can be, you know, a hand on the back, um, you know, uh, a hug if necessary. Whatever it takes, as long as it's appropriate to take care of the patient and their family. Um, sometimes emotional support is very important, especially when they don't have anybody there. So, you know, just know when it's appropriate. Obviously, this isn't necessarily something that can be taught, but it's okay to be a human being because really that's what you're there for. You're there to take care of people and to help them out. Stressful situations. For the provider, a lot of things might elicit uh, a, a stressful response for you. Uh, we have some of them listed here. Uh, mainly, you'll see that the biggest ones are going to be uh, how people deal with the death of a child in the field or the death of a co-worker in, in the field. These two things can be um, incredibly difficult for people. Uh, the, the children, uh, children dying or getting injured uh, severely is uh, very difficult for people, especially those with children um, because they relate those children to their own. Uh, I can think of a personal circumstance where I've got um, I have three kids. I've got one kid who was uh, ejected, not my child, but we went to a call where a child was ejected from the vehicle and uh, was not strapped in to the car seat, um, he was actually, or not strapped into the seat belt, but he was in the car seat. And when the kid was ejected out of the vehicle, the kid was actually inside the car seat still when we got there. And the kid's car seat was the same car seat that my son used. So that kind of bothered me because I associated the two together. And I think a lot of people uh, go through similar situations. So this is th these are very difficult things for us to all deal with. I can think of another situation where we had multiple ejections of children out of the back of a, a pickup truck. And when we got to the scene, somebody was carrying uh, an infant who was obviously deceased. And so we had to figure out a very quick triage situation. And it unfortunately w we were not able to help that particular infant because that infant was dead when we got there. It was a very difficult situations to deal with. Um, and then also, you know, if you're in the field for a while, you might encounter uh, the death or injury of a coworker. And so that's that's very th these things are absolutely horrible to deal with, but they can occur. So how do you deal with all this stress? Well, you really need to recognize what those warning signs are. You know, and also, what are the warning signs? Well, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about those later, but but basically, it's, it's the idea is that you're, you become burned out and apathetic about your job and cavalier, and you start missing things. Um, you know, how do you deal with that? You change your lifestyle. You make sure you balance your life. You know, you, you know, you, you've got to have a balance in your life. Too much work and, you know, your family life would suffer. Uh, too much time goofing off and your work's going to suffer. So you have to have a balance and you have to maintain this balance, especially when you're stressing out. Um, so that you keep yourself sane. 
family and friends, um, you know, if they don't understand what's going on, you know, it, it certainly makes things more difficult for you. And then work environment changes. So sometimes we have an incident where it is so absolutely horrific and difficult to deal with that we're going to call in a uh, critical incident stress debriefing team in there. And many of you have probably already gone to these um, CISDs as um, what we call them. Many of you probably already gone to them. But basically the idea is for everybody to get together and to talk about the situation shortly after the situation so that um, we can all support each other and be helpful to each other about the emotional responses that we might have had in a particular incident. Now shortly thereafter it is very it's really important that it's held as soon as possible because memory is short and it also helps us to kind of um, understand that we're all in it together. And this should be uh, a consortium of all providers that went to this particular call. So, you know, these, these calls can happen. Um, mainly, I would say a lot of the CISDs that I've been exposed to have been for children and infant calls, as well as uh, mass casualty incidents and then uh, co-workers getting severely injured, um, which didn't happen that often in, in my career, but um, the CISDs mainly were for um, those particular things. And we did, we would hold them within the 24 hour period. Um, as far as waiting 72 hours, that is a long time. Um, it is recommended that it's done as soon as possible, however, it might not necessarily always be feasible because you may have an incident that occurs on a Friday evening and then you know you might have to wait till Monday to get somebody in there that's actually trained so it really just depends um, again this is an open discussion where basically people can come in and talk about anything that they want to related to the call um, they are not you're not garnering information here or pointing fingers or placing blame or anything like that this is mainly designed primarily designed solely designed to help the responders deal with the emotional feelings and reactions as a result of the call that they just went on um, this information is like a counseling session and therefore is confidential none of this information should be used for disciplinary proceedings or anything that would violate the trust and confidentiality of all the members that are there. Uh, again, the CISD usually requires special training. Uh, just very briefly, uh, when we talked about personal safety before, um, and we're actually going to talk about personal safety again in a little while, um, we have to make sure that you know, there, there are body substance isolation precautions, that you have your vaccinations, that there are titers that are drawn uh, to ensure that you have uh, immunity to whatever diseases that you might be required to have immunity for. And then TB testing, which is usually done every six months to make sure that you don't have TB. Things to remember about personal safety. Um, always wear your personal protective equipment even if it doesn't look cool. This is kind of a funny thing. I, I always have thought that people will not put on gloves or they won't put on masks or goggles because they don't look cool with all that stuff on. And as providers, we kind of we are in the public spotlight all the time and and uh, you know we might not necessarily want to look funny um, with our gloves on or with our you know uh, goggles or masks but remember that these this PPE is so important for you to wear 
And I, ta I talked a lot about this before in the previous section, but uh, the idea behind wearing a mask is to make sure that you don't want to, you know, you don't catch some sort of disease um, that's airborne. And so um, you should wear the mask whenever they have any kind of respiratory condition because you just don't want to catch something and you don't want to spread it to someone else. Always wear your goggles whenever you're cleaning blood, vomit, or bodily fluids. Um, also remember when you're cleaning in, uh, cleaning in a sink that things can splash up and hit your eyes and then uh, you can get exposed. So it's just, you know, some little things to remember, especially if you're newer in the field. And then bloodborne pathogens, uh, HIV and AIDS. HIV is the infection, or HIV AIDS infection is the most life-threatening condition which results from AIDS. So what does that mean? Basically, if you have AIDS, then you're going to die from infection and not necessarily from AIDS itself. HPV and HCV uh, results in liver disease and liver cancer. So these are, HCV is really something that you want to watch out for and we'll go over um, more information about HCV later but uh, definitely want to keep yourself protected from that. Now we have scene and personal safety. So obviously if you're crouching like that, um, either you shouldn't have been in there in the first place or the scene uh, or, or you actually uh, showed up and then it wasn't as safe as it should have been. So not a good thing. Scene safety, again, uh, hand washing, eye protection, gloves, gown, masks, and then standard precaution. Standard precautions include the practice of protecting yourself from disease transmission from exposure to blood and body fluids. For hazardous materials, you're going to want to make sure you identify the potential hazards. So this is good. Uh, it's good to have binoculars or placards. Um, excuse me, it's good to have binoculars. When you're looking at placards, you should be able to identify what each placard means. And there's also an ERG book which will help you with um, identifying particular hazards and, and uh, what kinds of precautions should be taken as a provider. There's also additional information in the ERG. Uh, which would be helpful if you were more involved in a hazardous material response. Uh, the ERG is the Emergency Response Guidebook. And the Emergency Response Guidebook should be available in every ambulance for rapid identifications of possible hazmat incidents. Very good book to have. Everybody should have it. It should be available in every single unit that responds to an emergency call. Protective clothing, um, obviously people who are dealing with a hazardous material situation on a regular basis uh, should, be, uh, should have hazardous material suits as well as SCBAs. Uh, again, this is kind of more advanced training information. So if you are not trained in how to use this and it's not your department protocol, just be aware that it's out there. If you are trained, make sure you have the equipment on prior to responding to the incident. Uh, scene safety for hazmats, they're, the, again, they're controlled by specialized hazmat teams. Do not go in to a hazmat scene without the proper equipment or ability to take care of it. And not only that, but also, do not go into a hazmat scene at all if you are not going to be managing it. It's very important to think about collateral exposure. If your patient has been exposed to a hazardous material substance and you drive them into the hot zone, which is listed here, you have your green zone, your yellow zone, and red zone. If, if in the red zone obviously is the hot zone. Kind of looks more orange on this figure, but the idea is the same. If you pick up your patient 
and you drive them into the hot zone and you drive them from the hot zone rather to the hospital you are contaminating everybody this is absolutely unacceptable so remember that once the patient is in the hot zone that they need to be decontaminated and again this is something that only hazardous materials specialists should be dealing with um, and they should be calling the shots as far as what needs to be done uh, with regard to transport units. Again, EMTs provide emergency care only after the scene is safe and patient contamination is limited. Um, the last consideration in this particular section is violence. Uh, the scene should always be controlled by law enforcement prior to the EMT giving patient care, meaning that you should not be entering a scene that is unsafe. If you enter a scene that's unsafe, you should retreat from the scene. Always make sure that you notify dispatch of the specific reasons why, as that will be on the recorded line. Uh, people do not want to get the idea that you're abandoning them. However, you do need to look out for your safety. Um, there could be, always could be, perpetrators of the crime out there. Um, bystanders could be at risk and family members. Yes, they can be at risk, but you also have to think about yourself. Uh, make sure you don't disturb the crime scene unless it's required for medical care. So, you know, a, a lot of times, like, you'll have an example where somebody, or a question even, where, you know, it asks you, what do you do? Do you cut through the bullet holes, or do you cut around them, or what do you do? And, again, you you want to cut around the bullet holes so that you preserve the evidence. Um, same thing with a stab wound. You just want to cut around the shirt so you can preserve the evidence as much as possible kind of an interesting question but it does it does pop up from time to time make sure you maintain the chain of evidence so you know if for whatever reason you find something on the patient um, you immediately let the uh, let law enforcement know and uh, don't just give it off to another family member or uh, somebody else that's on the scene obviously that would be not not very intelligent to give off a knife but you know there's lots of other things that can be used as weapons and if they're removed too far from the scene then the chain of evidence can be broken and then in the court of law you're going to have difficulty with proving uh, guilt because the evidence will be missing so those are some things to think about and that's all there is for this particular lesson